Hello value viewers, I hope you're all doing very well. I was doing my weekly check through the Steam Sea Power Workshop looking for new additions to game when I stumbled across this. It's the addition of the Greyback class submarine from the early Cold War. This is a real gap in my knowledge and a really interesting piece of history, so I figured I had to do something on it. So today we're going to be looking at the Greyback and the accompanying Regulus 1 and 2 cruise missiles. First a bit of background for why I'm so interested. Over the last few months I've read four books on Cold War submarines. I've read Blind Man's Bluff about American Cold War submarines, Red Tide Rising about the Soviets, Down to the Sea and Submarines about the Royal Navy and another one about the Royal Navy, the name escapes me now. They're mainly about attack submarines, SSNs, but most mention SSBNs, Ballistic Missile Submarines. The purpose, of course, of Ballistic Missile Submarines is as a nuclear deterrent, MAD, mutually assured destruction, which in the most strange and perverse way has kept most of the world safe for the last 70 years or so. But why submarines? Well, a nuclear deterrent is only a deterrent if it cannot be compromised. Early Cold War B-58 bombers charging towards Moscow with nuclear bombs were not a deterrent if they could be shot down or intercepted by surface-to-air missiles before they reached their target. But if you put the nuclear deterrent on submarines and fired them from under the water, it would be almost impossible to compromise them. If an SSBN is operated correctly, they will never be found. The types of missiles fired by SSBNs, if we just look at the Americans, started with the Polaris series of missiles. Entering service 1960, ending service in about 1980. Next came Poseidon, entering service about 1971, ending service 1992. Then came the Trident series. Trident 1 entering about 1979, ending 2005, and Trident 2 entering service 1990, still being used in 2025. But what about before 1960? What about between 1945 and 1960? What was America's submarine-based nuclear deterrent? Well, it turns out it was Regulus, Regulus 1 and Regulus 2. These missiles were not ballistic missiles, they were cruise missiles. And in fact, if we wind back to World War II, the world's first automated cruise missiles were, of course, the V-1, fired by Germany from France against England. They were captured by the Americans before the end of World War II and reverse engineered. In fact, the Americans planned to use them against Japan. As far as I'm aware, they never actually did. Over the next few years, America was tasked with creating their own automated cruise missiles for the purpose of nuclear deterrent. The first missiles in service were, for the Navy, Regulus 1, and for the Army, the Matador. Regulus 1, later designated SSM N8, entered service 1955 and left service only nine years later, 1964, of course replaced by the Polaris. Today we're going to take a look at Regulus 1, Regulus 2, we're going to use them in a live fire situation. We're going to look at their strong points, we're going to look at their weak points and decide why they had to be replaced by ballistic missiles. So let's start with Regulus 1, aboard a diesel greyback submarine. It's late 1950s, the Cold War has gone hot. This submarine is in the Barents Sea and is tasked with attacking the naval areas of Kola Peninsula around Mamansk there. First of all, let's talk about the submarines. In total, five submarines were equipped to carry Regulus 1. The existing Gato-class Tunny and Baleo-class Barbero could each carry two missiles. But the Navy wanted a class of submarines specifically that could carry Regulus. And that's what we see here, the Greyback class, consisting of Greyback and Growler both entering commission 1958. Each had this strange looking hangar arrangement here which could carry a total of four Regulus 1 or two Regulus 2. An additional submarine was created, Halibut, entering service 1960 and I believe I've read in Blind Man's Bluff it was eventually converted into a special purpose submarine so I'd like to know your thoughts on that. 
The Regulus 1 cruise missile had a max range of 500 nautical miles, but it couldn't generally be used at that range because, as a weak point, it was a direct radio link controlled missile, which means that the firing vehicle and or additional support vehicles had to guide it, a bit like a remote control aircraft. Line of sight had to be maintained at all points. From what I can find, the absolute maximum that a firing submarine could launch the missile and get it to target at would be just over 200 nautical miles and so we're just 200 nautical miles north of Mamansk here. Note that the missile could be passed on to an aircraft to guide it further or a surface ship but it's very unlikely in a scenario like this you're going to be able to maintain a friendly aircraft around this airspace or a friendly surface ship so the best we're going to do is 200 miles. So that's probably the first weak point of Regulus 1. Uh, so let's get underway. The first thing we're going to do is to surface. Boof. In terms of defence, obviously, the Cold War has gone hot. Russia's or the Soviets are not just going to sit and take this. They're going to have naval maritime patrol aircraft, uh, Cu-142, uh, a naval maritime variant of the Bear, with radars that are sitting looking for American submarines. Now we come on to the next weak point of Regulus. It can't be fired from underwater like Polaris or other ballistic missiles, it has to be fired from the surface, so they're going to expose themselves to hostile radar and countermeasures. Up she comes. Okay, let's get our first missile on the way. She carries four in this hangar arrangement here, so I'm going to go there, I'm going to fire 200 miles away. There go. She's going to turn slightly off board, she's going to open her hangar up, which is really interesting to see. You've got your water and pressure type bulkhead arrangement there. In terms of time, you can see we started probably about two minutes. She must have broken the uh, water past 10 Zulu. Guys are now preparing to literally wheel this thing out. If you can look at Wikipedia and whatnot, you can see pictures of them hand cranking these missiles into place. And they were massive missiles. They had to carry uh, I think it was a 1.5 ton nuclear warhead of different yields or different variants and so it needed a large long range vehicle to uh, deliver that warhead. Out she slides and we're five minutes so we've been exposed for about three and a half minutes now. This is Regulus 1. You can see that she's very much shaped by aviation of the era, the first or second generation of jet aircraft. She was powered by an Allison J33 turbojet, so you may know that from aircraft like the P-80 Shooting Star or the F-94. It produced just shy of 5,000 pounds of thrust and two solid rocket JATOs to get it airborne. A max speed would have been just shy of Mark uh, 0.85, and max possible range, as I said, of 500 nautical miles, and off she goes. Jato's jettison, and I'll say at this point, kudos for making such an awesome mod. It's, uh, it's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And off she goes, and there's not much to do now, apart from speed up. Now the submarine at this point can't dive. It has to maintain a line of sight to that guy at all points. So it's gonna have to sit here, or close its hangar to reduce its radar cross-section slightly, but it's gonna have to now sit and wait. At this point, a bear over here, uh, what is it, 90 miles away, I see no reason with its powerful look down radar here, but it couldn't see that submarine, so it's gonna go in for an attack. I'm gonna grab a bunch of these, and I'm gonna go attack, greyback, go. The turbojet powered missile uh, gets up to about 30,000 feet, as I said, just subsonic. And like I said, in a live war situation, there's no way you could have chase planes operating this thing in, they would be compromised immediately. We are now 11 minutes in, so the submarine's been exposed for nine minutes or so. Bear, 23 miles away, it's not looking pretty. Bombay doors open, torpedoes ready. I guess those are the boys there. We are 17 minutes in. I don't think the missile's gonna make it to Mamanx. It's just too slow. And the submarine's just too vulnerable. Let's see if he's gonna drop his torpedoes. And he's not, because yes he is. And immediate crash dive, crash dive. Very deep, go, blow the tanks. Dive planes out, run. Torpedoes in the water, 
get down, change direction, noisemaker out. And of course, what we've done there is we've broken the signal and the missile has gone dumb. Now what would it actually do at this point? It would probably just fall out of the sky and be absolutely useless. Uh, so that was a demonstration of using Regulus against, I guess, a realistic target at the max possible range in the scenario and the weaknesses. So that led, of course, to the development of Regulus 2. So let's run the identical scenario with Regulus 2. The first thing we're going to do is surface. The Regulus 2 was much longer, much larger and heavier. So she could only carry two, one in each uh, semi-hanger. Up we go. Alright, let's get this thing done. So, let's fire one Regulus to Mamansk. Now she comes, and it was a very snug fit from the information I could find online. Now, the Regulus 2 was entering the supersonic era, obviously, and it took the technology that was available for the planes of the time. It entered service as SSM N9, entering service 1958, and was removed from service the same year, later 1958. Technology was moving so quickly at this time, it was very expensive, it was a very big commitment to maintain Regulus 2, and at that point the writing was already on the wall. This is not a viable way of operating a nuclear deterrent. They needed ballistic missiles, and of course that's what today is all about. I mean, look at the size of it, and you can see where its heritage comes from, Starfighter, Phantom, all that stuff. In terms of its credentials, it was powered by a single General Electric J79, a very popular turbojet powering aircraft like the F-104 Starfighter, like the F-4 Phantom from the 1950s, 1960s. It also had one solid rocket motor to get it, as you can see, airborne. It had a flight ceiling of about 60,000 feet. Critically, it was supersonic. It could go around twice the speed of sound and that's how it would A, offer its penetration and B, just make it harder to defend against. Now, the guidance was the critical thing about Regulus 2 as well. Whereas Regulus 1 needed constant data link or, or radio direct control, this had an inertial navigation system which was pre-aligned to the ship's navigation system and of course they had a navigation system in the late 1950s I forget what it's called it had a really interesting name and it was a, a very uh, basic gyro based system but it worked and what that means of course is as soon as this guy drops down and we get watertight we can crash dive and it will navigate its way to target so down we go guys let's get the chuff out of here before the bear even sees us and chugga 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 down we go. And safety and freedom. Back to the missile. Well, it's going to work its merry way on now. Again, about a tonne and a half of nuclear warhead. As well as that, just bigger missile could go higher and it could go further. Over 1,000 nautical miles, meaning it could actually be fired all the way up here, kind of towards the Arctic Circle, although I haven't done that here. So we can see a massive improvement there, times speed by 20. So now, all they have to worry about is this guy being spotted by a radar in the late 1950s, kind of early 1960s, if it had remained in service, and shot down by the fledgling Soviet SAM-1, maybe SAM-2, or supersonic interceptors of the time. Question to you guys, could it have been shot down by supersonic interceptors? And uh, let's say SAM-1, SAM-1 was in, in the mid-50s uh, to late 1950s. I mean, look at that. That is a very small cross-section for the time to see. Could Soviet radars have seen that and sent the interceptors up? I don't know. What about the SAMs? SAM-1 had a maximum ceiling of about 60,000 feet. The missile would have gone about Mark 2.5 at its absolute apex of speed, just shy of what this could do. Could you actually intercept this with SAM-1? Well, I don't know, and I've got no real way of uh, modelling it, but I'd like to know your thoughts on that, viewers, if it could have got through. We are 14 minutes into the whole thing. has taken less than a quarter of an hour to go over 200 nautical miles. Now, what it would do at this point is... There are no nuclear explosions in sea power or DCS, so at this point it's just going to terminate. In real life, it knew, knows it was reaching its target. It would now fly to a pre-set altitude. 
and explode obviously with uh, uh, its airburst. Uh, it's not going to do that here, it's just going to probably lose track and just fly away in a random direction. And that's pretty much all I've got to show you viewers. So Regulus 1, mid 1950s, massive drawbacks, had to be fired above water, compromising your deterrent. And once fired it had to maintain line of sight which would have taken a long time. 25 to 30 minutes I think that was going to take to uh, get our Regulus 1 on target which is a real problem. Regulus 2, massive improvement. We don't have to maintain line of sight and it can be fired further away and it gets to target quicker. But still, you have to break the surface of the water to fire it. It's also a very cumbersome and ungainly thing to maintain and operate. Imagine trying to operate this on the submarine into position in a high sea state. You probably just couldn't do it, right? Also, the vehicle itself, as impressive as it is, is Captain Mark II. Could that be intercepted? very possibly. So of course it all had to be replaced and rightly so by Polaris of which it and its successors have kept us safe for the last 70 years. I hope you enjoyed that and bye bye.